He's an award-winning actor, director, and creator of the Broadway smash Hedwig and the Angry Inch. Now he's using his immense talents to create a hilarious new podcast called Cancellation Island. John Cameron Mitchell, everybody. Welcome to the South by Southwest Thank studio. Thank you. Oh, what an attractive audience. <laughs> They're all out there. So like quiet. I got my eye on one of them. <laughs> like, oh, <laughs> How are you doing today? I'm like, good. Yeah? yeah. Yeah. Happy to be here with you, man. Thank I'm, you. You know, I'm, I just told you I'm really happy that like I have some friends who are very jealous that I'm talking to you. So I'm just soaking up every moment of this. Only I could monetize that. But that would be <laughs> cameo. Yeah, no, yeah. That, that's definitely cameo, right? I just got recognized by some Chinese girls from mainland China. I was like, how do you know about me? Was, wow. Because think, you know, this is digital time and mm -hmm. things get around. They the get world's their, smaller. Got mm -hmm. their VPNs. They're watching stuff, <laughs> you know, that they're not supposed to. And You're just kind of looking at them like, hmm, is yeah. that against the law to know who I am? I mean, that has a lot of, that gives me a lot of hope, yeah. you know. The connectivity has been a game changer for people, let's say, who don't always find their people right away, like mm -hmm. queer people. And then it somehow makes other people worse. Yeah. Yeah. That's, it's a weird thing about the internet. Yeah. And if someone came up on TikTok, I felt like I was bred in the internet, you know? Yeah. Because I get both sides of it. And plus, I'm a movie reviewer slash critic, whatever. Right. So I make a living putting my opinions on media on the internet, which is a big no-no, as you would know, because... I mean, do you get over... I mean, ha having grown up with it, mm -hmm. do you feel that it's hard to... It, do you have an attention deficit from it, do you think? Uh, is built I don't. In? You don't? That's yeah, great. I don't. Because, like, again, my main thing is, like, I love, like, consuming film, no matter, like, you know, how... So you'll go there, you won't... I'm more than happy to go there. Yeah, exactly. Um, but, you know, the me, I feel like I'm almost contributing to the whole thing, because, like, a lot of my videos are about, like, two minutes long. It's, like, right. how to give a nice... Concise, concise review in yeah. like you know a small amount of time yeah so now i'm just that but that's why i use other things like my podcast and youtube to kind of like right. help out with that it. but well, let's not talk about me let's talk oh. about you like this is how nice that you are like this is this is <laughs> incredible <laughs> but why don't you tell us about your latest project yes. cancellation island what well, is it about it is about a rehab for canceled people mm. <laughs> that holly hunter's character uh who is a kind of a wellness guru mm -hmm. starts and uh i wrote it with michael cavadias who's okay. here and produced my producer christy gressman and I, it's my second fictional podcast series the first one was anthem homunculus that mm -hmm. I, it's out now uh, but Cancellation Island is sort of, it kind of came out of some frustration, you know, in the last few years, obviously everyone's trying to like do the right thing and mm -hmm. like make sure everyone's respected. At the same time, there's a, a group of people who don't necessarily give a shit about anybody, right? right? Except course. their own team. And so you get a lot of people when you have a Trump on top of like trying to fix the world really fast. So then you start getting, you can't say that, you can't say that, mm -hmm. call out culture. And to me, that starts to, when you're policing, it starts to uh, divide the people who are naturally, of course, who are naturally have things in common, you know? And so it was frustration with that. So it was a little bit of a leftist comedic uh, uh, critique of can uh, cancel culture, but then quickly became about other things because cancel culture is about other things. Right, it's right. about fear. Mm -hmm. It's about uh, what's true. You know, it's, it's uh, that's why, a character says, if all news is fake, all stories must be true. Mm. Mm. You know, so we're in a time where every goddamn story doesn't need a f evidence anymore, right? It's, right. Everything's a, everyone's a conspiracy theorist. Mm -hmm. and, I've seen that. <laughs> right? <laughs> and, on that. every s possible side. And weirdly, the only thing that seemed to affect people are not facts, which they were like, well, that's fake news. That's a fake video, right? right. Trump's, right. you know, slapping that old lady doesn't exist it's doesn't exist yeah and, CG. <laughs> yeah he's weirdly this old guy has taken advantage of a kind of uh, moment in time when digital has called all fact into question mm -hmm. but in that time the only thing that everyone can agree on is that they could possibly be moved by a story yes and you can have you know a QAnon story and you can also ha maybe have a beautiful one mm -hmm. so cancellation island is our comedy version talking about these fears mm. um and it's uh good we did it with a live audience there's about yeah. 15 actors and it'll be coming out in may uh looks like that sounds great yeah and i, I love the way you describe like how this is told like i'm not sure if i've ever like see uh, something like this with like a live audience so can you talk about like the difference the what's different about this podcast in terms of like how the story is told and the production that kind of like 
that you use. I mean, obviously there's podcasts and stuff where there's live audiences and comedians and stuff, mm -hmm. but the idea of doing a, a in effect, a, a film, a, I right. call it audio cinema in a way, uh, you don't usually have an audience. But I, when I came up as an actor, we had all kinds of stuff. We had sitcoms, which mm -hmm. was a live audience. Mm -hmm. And in those sitcoms, you would often do another take with new lines. Right. So I'm directing my actors in front of a live audience who are slightly drunk in, <laughs> in Brooklyn <laughs> for four hours a night for two nights because we want to do the whole series and get right. the audience reactions. And I'm directing the actors on mic and the audience is hearing that, and which is not usually, actors get nervous about that. Right. But in this case, it was fun. We were all, in, I'm, they're insulting me, I'm insulting <laughs> them. So the, the communal thing, uh, the digital stuff can be a little lonely, you mm -hmm. know, like even listening to a podcast or this, recording it, just a couple people. But right. here it became like a, a communal experience. You bring people yeah. in like on the fun. Yeah, like I'm all about trying to get people in rooms. That and I've also done listening parties like I did a seven hour marathon listening party for my whole last mm -hmm. series with dinner included in yeah. a movie theater that we mixed for surround sound. Wow. We mixed the, the whole uh, series, yeah. podcast series in surround sound. I would love an invite to one of those. That yeah, sounds incredible. Yeah, that awesome. Never been to one of those before. All right, so let's talk about, like we can't have you here and not talk about Hedwig and the Angry Inch, right? And it's had such a, lasting and huge cultural impact. And I just want to know, like as someone who created something and saw the reception of it, did you have, how did you kind of like reckon and how did that resonate with you when it started happening? Like, were you like surprised, shocked? Like It was nicely slow. You mm -hmm. know, I don't think quick shifts are good for anybody's psyche, right. i.e. suddenly being famous, mm -hmm. winning the lottery, suddenly losing everything, obviously. I heard know. that one, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> lottery? Uh, TikTok, like, overnight type yes. thing that and, happened. And, and if you're not and you're not always ready for it mm -mm. and then it disappears it's, just it, as fast. It's a, you get addicted to it, like you think yeah. like once it stops, you're like, yeah. did I deserve it in the first place? Right. It's a whole thing that goes on with Yeah, that. and it's not natural. Mm -hmm. I think you can be no one should get a lot of money or attention till they're sane. Mm -hmm. That's <laughs> you know, that's a good one. <laughs> you know, or an adult, because it will destroy you. Mm -hmm. And there's fascinating documentaries about people, uh, groups of people who have won the lottery, and mm -hmm. pretty much 90, I think 85% wish it hadn't happened. Really? Because suddenly they couldn't trust anybody. They have thought, oh, what moment, you know, some people come money. out the woodwork. Looking yeah, for the and you're yeah. like, you end up just wanting to be alone, like, you, you know, like Shia LaBeouf or something, probably. Yeah. Yeah. To, you know, it's like growing up in that. So, to me, it's like all in good time, and with Hedvig, it was a slow boil, so that mm -hmm. you know, from getting people's addresses to mail them flyers mm -hmm. in the fir at the beginning in '94, to it finding its way digitally, and now I actually c can go into Korea and Japan and sing for five thousand people because, yeah. it, for some reason, Hedvig connected there, mm -hmm. you know, and places I don't expect, you right. know, Brazil. Australia, I mean, Britain makes sense, but so it's it's in, allowed me to introduce myself to all kinds of people. Mm -hmm. It's like a kind of passport, uh, but it's never been a big money thing, which right. probably has kept it sane and cool. Mm -hmm. You know, too much yeah. money actually will mess things up. I think right. everyone should get just enough money. Right, just enough money, yeah. but like the appreciate the widespread appreciation. Yeah, is like it's the nice. love of what you yeah. do. And we we probably you probably have met people who are famous for things they're not proud of. Mm. Yeah. And you end up getting people you don't really like mm. saying, eh, you know, <laughs> take a picture and it's like the, you, you get become the whole thing, yeah. Yeah, no. you become a product and that can drive you insane. Mm. I mean, just look at what the K pop kids are having to do with they're all going crazy. Yeah, yeah, and that that was one of those things I feel like we all experienced just kinda like got thrusted upon everybody very, very fast. Next mm -hmm. you know, K pop is just going nuts and like everybody's listening to it. So imagine I'm just imagining the people at the center of it, the artists that you know have to deal totally with that. Controlled, too. you know, it's 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 insane. Now, Hedwig and the Angry Inch made like a very successful transition to film. Yeah. Like, how did, like, how did you go about like maintaining its essence and like get doing that successful transition? It was a weird it? time, you know. It was another golden age of American film, the '90s mm -hmm. and 2000s. You know, they would say maybe. The the 30s and 40s, then mm -hmm. the 70s was a big time for American film. Right. And then the 90s, it was before streamers, before major right. digital, mm -hmm. which of course killed it, killed small films to 
to an extent. Yeah, mostly. mostly so a little bit. Yeah, yeah. they're out there, but like you know, it gets harder. Yeah, it's know? just people aren't going to the theater and they're not like seeking them out. Yeah. So that's why I exist on TikTok to like pull I know. those things well, out. That's you the know? thing. You have to say you got to go back to the source, mm -hmm. and that's why I worry about the you know the ADD. It's like they're not going to be able to absorb mm -hmm. it. And I make stuff that's old school, analog, seventies. I'm a seventies person, mm -hmm. and I grew up in the military, so all music, all kinds of films, all genre were valid to me. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like yeah. I, I don't get it when people are one thing. Like I like to do it all. I like yeah. to direct and produce and sing and and do punk rock concerts. It's no like, box for you, man. Yeah, I don't <laughs> like to be limited. And I think a lot of young people feel that way too, but maybe they're only doing it online. Mm -hmm. You know, there is a kind of broader, let's say, view of music. You right. know, people used to define themselves by their music and I think that's opened up a bit and you know but there's too much information too and there's still what do you call it taste maker there's still people like you that have to remind or point out the direction mm -hmm. in this giant network right. um, that is worth following you know and um, otherwise it really would there'd be nothing left do you think that uh, there's going to be uh, limitation, you know, government limitation on content? Uh, on content, I mean, we're kind of already seeing it with like Twitter, you know what I'm saying? Like, and I'm not right. really on but Twitter like that. But that's just bought by a, another By another king, like, guy, you know. But with TikTok, like, you know, there's already conversation of like, you know, it's security, like, you know, national security, like China and those, right. and those type of conversations. So there's real conversations right now about it being banned, like in the next like. I mean, it's not just the apps, but isn't it yeah. like general, just the, the internet in general? There was some oh, starting yeah. to. You know, in in Congress recently, just yeah, to that, that's the TikTok net thing. Net neutrality. Yeah, Isn't I think I, I don't want to say it's like net neutrality, but mm -hmm. definitely kind of like I don't know if it's even restriction. Like something mm -hmm. like TikTok, they're just trying to like get rid of it all together. Mm -hmm. But because what's of to like stop the, to the state of Texas just uh, censoring? Mm. Anything that they think is sexual. There for was, example. there was a, uh, I believe it was Florida that also tried to put like an age limit on the people who could use certain apps, right? right? And so I do believe like we're talking about a slippery slope here, where it's like, yeah. where do you stop? Where's the yeah. line? Yeah, I mean, as right? a parent, I would probably understand some of those. Absolutely, right? yeah. I, I got a six-year-old daughter, so I could definitely understand yeah, that you as well. Them, like yeah, but I think like, and I think this like leads perfectly into the question of like, you know, content creation and content consumption is, I believe, a form of like artistic expression. Mm -hmm. And you have made things that said a lot about self-discovery, identity. Yeah. So where do you see like the overlap of kind of like identity and artistic expression when it comes to? You know, there's all of modern life and certainly America has always been that, that struggle between the individual and the community, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And we, America, in some way, prides itself on f we're based on freedom, and you know we escaped the British or whatever, <laughs> we killed the, the natives, and we brought the slaves right, over, right, right. and we did that as individuals, uh, and, and it was actually a group of communities. But we had a weird. This is a weird country, you know. Mm -hmm. It's 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 got this kind of weird optimism that's based on uh, atrocity, mm -hmm. and then people. But what I do like about the optimism is that let's fix it, you know, is yeah. the feeling. Yeah. And sometimes they do, do it the wrong way. Mm -hmm. But to me, it's like I have always been on that knife point. Point. My dad was a general in the army. Mm -hmm. I grew up very religious, so I knew about rigidity. And I weirdly, my queerness allowed me to escape it. Mm -hmm. If I was straight, I might not have. Because right. when I was told, oh, there's something, you're going to hell or something because you're queer, I was like, well, that's wrong. Mm -hmm. So there must be some other things they said that might be wrong. Too. Right, right. It makes you question a lot. Yeah. yeah. And if everything's handed to you and you're the ruling class, you don't question things. If someone judges you for how you look or if you have to hide something about yourself, mm -hmm. you understand metaphor earlier than those other people. Because mm -hmm. you know that there's a surface and then there's a true nature. Yep, yep. Even when you're five, you know, and if everything is handed to you, you, things are what they are. Mm -hmm. They are their surface. But if you've had some, if someone's judged you by your surface, right. or you've had, say, like I'm in the closet and I'm like, of where my surface, I gotta butch up because I'm gonna hide my, then you know there's layers. Yeah. And that is a privilege. You know, that knowledge can hurt, can be too much and mm. you can send you into Especially drugs. Especially someone so young, yeah. Yeah, if you're yeah. not ready for it. 
But if you're ready for it and you got guides, that can make you into an artist. Mm -hmm. It can make you into a, a politician that's trying new things. It, make, it can make you a scientist that questions mm -hmm. things. Yeah. So to me, being different, being the outsider, being the misfit is a privilege mm -hmm. that can kill you mm -hmm. and it can make you, it's a superpower. Yeah. I like I like I really like what you said there, and I like how you started it in a place of like you know this is a weird country and like we have to f like the way it's built kind of creates and this was what I was gonna say a group of individuals with their own individual like kind of like goals and like right. you know sensibilities and things like that and you as a creative like you know all these experiences made you the individual that you are today yeah. uh, so you know I think this is like a microcosm of where we are as a country where again a group of individuals who have to make decisions and you know we're all fighting against each other when yeah. we should be uh, but when it comes to like the creative process like how do you like how do you approach like collaborating with other artists with that like type of mindset? I actually get bored fully on my own, which is probably why I'm not a novelist yet. So, mm -hmm. actually, when I was thinking about my last podcast, Anthem Homunculus, which is mm -hmm. a lot of autobiography, I was like, should I write this in prose? You know, mm -hmm. should I? But then I just seem, seem lonely. Yeah. You know, I just like to work with people, so I I like to be the daddy to kind of create the the place that it happens be like the architect yeah but i hate to micromanage i'm like what do you you know what do you got what do you got to bring the party mm -hmm. and that's a very military thing that's a good thing about the military which i describe as a social estate for rednecks mm -hmm. and poor people <laughs> they don't realize it but they're socialists <laughs> they got health care they got housing everybody's from somewhere else mm -hmm. i don't I, n I didn't experience racism growing up in the military even though it was probably there mm -hmm. because everyone was doing the job and everyone was from somewhere else right and you know my dad was black uh, I mean, my dad's boss was black not my dad <laughs> um but to me it was like a weird laboratory situation there was still macho af you know misogynist homophobic stuff going on but in terms of its it's the way it worked is what I brought in, what I bring into my work. Mm -hmm, right. It's like a theater kid, you know, I moved around a lot in the military, actors move around a lot. My dad, as a general, I saw him delegate, you know, I saw him make jokes to relax everybody, mm -hmm. and I saw him say, I don't know, what do you think? Mm. You know, some leaders right. refuse to admit they don't know. Mm -hmm. That's a bad leader, right? Right. right. Say, so, I don't know, what do you think? What do you think? Gather it together and make a decision. Everyone feels wanted. Mm -hmm. Everyone's got something to say. Please give me your initiative. So I like being that kind of host yeah. type of a leader. Yeah. You know, and that's, uh, it must be lonely people just painting or writing. You have control, but who do you celebrate with when mm -hmm. it's over? It's, it's, it's a heavy burden to bear as like, you know, that type of leader where you're just kind of carrying everything and you don't ask for help, right? And yeah. like you said, I, th I believe also like leaders should be able to kind of do that. Um, you know, but uh, getting back to like your creative choices and your artistic choices, like something such as Hedwig, like you create things that are like bold and unconventional, yeah. right? Just like how you said your father, like in, in the way we view a leader, traditionally yeah. it's an unconventional way to be a leader, but you're, used to being bold and unconventional in the way you approach things artistically. Um, how do you like navigate the balance of like taking a risk like that, right? Like doing something that people haven't necessarily done before and trying those type of things. Well, you know, I've always been Apollonian as opposed to Dionysian and Dionysian is described as like in the flow, mm -hmm. you know, drunk is an example, Dionysian, <laughs> yeah. you know, like you're in it. Like water, like Bruce Lee said. You know? yeah. yeah, or like, be like Iggy water. Pop or, you mm -hmm. know, there's some people who are Apollonian who are more like, they're more in control of where they are mm -hmm. or they're more present, to, like David Bowie, if yeah. you're talking about rock and roll. Mm -hmm. But other people, and some people are in, like Prince. You never see him out of control. Yeah. Right? Yeah. He's made his world and you're happy to be in it, right? Yeah. Like Hitchcock. Other people, let's say some punk rockers, some certain rappers, that you don't know what's going to happen. And it's in, even like Judy Garland, she mm -hmm. may die on stage. Mm -hmm. And David Bowie ain't never gonna die on stage. Mm -hmm. He's gonna die beautifully. <laughs> you know, he made his album as he was dying. Right. You know, in his last video, and he came out in the day after he died. Mm -hmm. You know, he was made it into a work of art. Yeah. Other people don't. So 
I'm maybe more on the Bowie side in terms of like creating an environment, but I want to get to that place where I can be in the flow. Yeah, that's good. You know, but it has to be a safe place. Mm -hmm. So that, to me, I, I was a Broadway actor, and then I would hang out at this club, Squeeze Box, that my collaborator there used to hang out at, mm -hmm. and, and I learned about drag and punk rock, and that's where Hedvig came from. Mm -hmm. It was me trying to get out of structure, yeah. you know, and, and open up and like see what would happen. And rock and roll was my way. That's really cool. Well, your work is like, including Hedwig, has contributed to like LGBTQ plus representation like across the board. And it's been amazing. Uh, how do you see the progress made in recent years when it comes to that to like further advance that representation? Well, representation is one thing. And then there's, let's just say when you feel invisible for a while, just to see yourself somewhat visible or someone like you mm -hmm. is a big deal, right? right? But that's just the beginning, mm -hmm. right? Visibility, yeah. representation is just the beginning. It's, re it's required, but then it's, it's, it's interesting. Like a lot of, for example, my queer filmmakers, their first thing is a very queer story. It's personal, it's often mm -hmm. autobiographical, but uh, usually the next one is about some, somebody else because mm -hmm. you've not cured yourself, but you've, maybe graduated from autobiography. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, you, it tells you something. Nowadays, there is a structure of like, John, that's not your story to tell, mm. right? You get that, right? Yeah. That's not your story. Is that your story to tell? And I'm like, well, if you follow that logic, then we can only make autobiographies. Make autobiographies. Yeah. And if we want to, nar you know, I don't want a Netflix of narcissists. I want people investigating themselves and then moving on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because all if you're just wanking off, ta <laughs> talking, talking about, about yourself. yourself. <laughs> Some people do it brilliantly, but like, you yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah. And it's like, okay, good, fine. If you really follow that logic, then you can't even have your mom in your story because you're mm -hmm. appropriating her story. Yeah. It's like, let's relax. Right. There's a way of writing a character that doesn't exist, right? It's about them in the community. Right. right. Mm -hmm. As someone who does not exist, it's fictional. Yep who isn't you, mm -hmm. right? It's actually in fiction that we find ourselves putting ourselves in someone else's shoes right. and feeling something. Mm -hmm. You cannot have empathy with the autobiography only. You gotta have fiction. Yes. There's even studies saying that people who read more fiction have more empathy. I don't know how they do that. Yeah. But it's like, so to me, it's like, it's more about, if you're writing about stuff you don't know about, find the fuck out, Yeah. right? Yeah. Find out from everybody. I think it's about going out into the world, experiencing people and those different types of things, being inspired by those different types of things and wanting to kind of like tell that story. Yes. Right? Like not necessarily saying like this story is mine, but no. necessarily like this story was made from someone that I have empathy towards, that I admire. Those and obviously there's some things in common because you probably wouldn't write about it. Exactly. You know, my film Shorpus was about a, a Chinese Canadian woman who's never had an orgasm and she's a sex therapist. And back then, it was, you know, the only thing we were fighting was sort of a right wing, oh, you can't show that film. Mm -hmm. When we re-released it, I got some young people saying, is that really your story to tell that Asian woman not having an orgasm? Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> there's something called metaphor. You yeah. know, we work together on this character. There's elements mm -hmm. of her, there's elements of me. Right. You know, the metaphor of faking an orgasm has a lot to do with people looking at you. Mm. You know, and if you're a woman, it's usually a man. Mm. And so we get into that, and I understand that as a gay man, you know. So we have more in common than, than we think. It's just do the work, go there, you know, find out. And then your fictional character is informed mm -hmm. and real. I like that. Let's, I'll drink a water to that, man. All cheers right, cheers that to that. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining the South by Southwest studio. This was a very You're great welcome. conversation. Yeah. This is, seriously, Thank man. you. This is an incredible shot. I should have got more stone before. <laughs> Look for Cancellation <laughs> Island on the podcast oh. platform soon. <laughs> you can watch on our studio interviews on the YouTube channel. That's South by Southwest YouTube channel, youtube.com slash SXSW. I'm your host, Juju Green. Thank you so much for watching.